Hello everyone, I'm a, a classicist from Warwick and I'm very uh, much interested in two questions of uh, group identity, uh, structuralism and how power dynamics work in uh, particularly ancient societies. And for the purpose of this project I'm very much looking at the Greeks or Hellenes and how they interacted in Egypt sort of after Alexander's conquest. So the key date uh, for us really is sort of about 323 BC, that's when Alexander has finished his more exploratory quests east up until the river Indus and has come back to Babylon, which is highlighted here. And he subsequently dies, probably of a tropical disease. Uh, most people seem to think it's uh, yellow fever. And because Alexander doesn't leave uh, a proper heir to secure his kingdom, the entire empire sort of fractures amongst his varying generals. And for our purposes, we're really concerned with uh, Ptolemy I, who represents the, uh, the blue territory down here, so sort of Egypt, modern-day Libya, Cilicia here, Cyprus, and some of the Aegean islands. And I love coins for iconography because, as you can see, Ptolemy I is not the most flattering uh, imagery of a, of a leader. You'll notice his sort of bulbous chin, huge hooked nose, deep set <coughs> eyes. But what's crucial as well is this uh, symbol here, which goes through his hair, and that is the double diadem. That's a symbol of Hellenic kingship, and it's usually also given to victors after athletic contexts, particularly the uh, Olympic Games as well. But before we get on to that, I think it's important to have some sort of uh, context for what the Greeks are going into Egypt with. Uh, so I'm sure some of you are aware of Herodotus. He's also the father of history, father of lies. But because I'm looking at it from a cultural perspective, I'm not so much interested in that. I'll read this quote aloud for you because it's absolutely fantastic. Had they, i.e. the Egyptians, instituted customs and laws contrary for the most part to those of the rest of mankind, among them the women buy and sell, the men stay at home and weave, and whereas in weaving all of, the, uh, all of us push the woof upwards, the Egyptians push it downwards. Men carry burdens on their heads, women on their shoulders. Women pass water standing, men sitting. Now, feminist um, historians love this piece because they go, oh, what a fabulous society Egypt was, a true place for women in the ancient world. But they sort of, they miss the historical point because it has a lot to do with Herodotus' conception of geography rather than any traditional historical value. Uh, so he had this idea of um, sort of Egypt, sorry, uh, Greece and uh, Asia Minor here being sort of the center of the world. And the more you got away from the periphery, the stranger people became. So if you go to the north, people are very hardy, but they're very stupid. So that's pretty much the Britain's conception for you. And when you go to Persia, the people are soft, they're effeminate, but they're intelligent. And that's not intelligence in the sense of Aristotle, but it's more like sly cunning. And so obviously Egypt being on the periphery of this uh, sort of geographical and ideological sphere is sort of uh, being uh, alienized in that context. Now, uh, to sort of discuss the sort of power dynamic of uh, an Egyptian king who Ptolemy was in an Egyptian setting, I think this temple is absolutely fantastic. It's the Temple of Horus, and if you conceptualize Horus as sort of a creator god, you wouldn't be far wrong in that period. Uh, the first thing you'll notice is that there's a huge dating discrepancy. Uh, that is the uh, date it was actually founded, but Ptolemaic leaders continuously reuse the iconography on this temple, so we can't actually identify which specific Ptolemy is on it but it shows so much how the Ptolemaic leaders were concerned with this piece anyway. And also you notice Edfu is down here in what is known as Upper Egypt. The Egyptians had a reverse conception of geography in their own land because the Nile flowed northwards. It's one of the few rivers in the world that actually does that. So uh, this is the temple how it was as it was discovered by David Roberts who was basically uh, an archaeologist slash artist who went around the sort of Middle East detailing these temples and whatnot. And what we uh, eventually did in sort of the 1850s is we got rid of the sand enroachment here and we drained some of this lake around as well and we really got to hearts with the temple. Uh, it's not entirely uh, important because I'm looking at the iconography on the walls, but just so you get an idea, these are the huge pylons uh, near the gateway which you saw and then it goes into sort of a peristyle hall and that's basically just like a, a colonnade in a square essentially. And outside what you have is this, outside the whole of the temple is a hypostyle wall which is basically... Um, a wall supported by colonnades. Um, also you notice uh, a nilometer, which was quite an important feature of uh, Egyptian temples generally. Uh, what the Egyptian priests used to do is they used to go out in sort of winter times and whatever and they used these nilometers to measure or predict flood levels so that the, <coughs> the pharaoh could charge tax in advance. So if the uh, Nile didn't actually flood to that level, the leader still made his money but the farmers are somewhat ripped off. Uh, and there's also a birthing, uh, birth house here, uh, it wouldn't have been a part of the temple because uh, basically birth was considered a polluted act. The actual imagery itself is uh, very interesting. So over here you have Horus, so I've talked, to, uh, talked about him as a creator god, and he's uh, being depicted in sort of this divine cosmic battle. 
against chaos. Now, when you think of chaos, you mustn't think of something like the London riots. The chaos is sort of that primordial state before the universe. There aren't atoms, there aren't void, there isn't even space, it's just nothing. Chaos is the antithesis to civilization, which Horus represents. And the biggest thing you've got to try and get your head around is that Egyptian gods, unlike Greek and Roman, they're not immortal in a sense because they die, and they die every day, and they're reborn. So Horus, sort of in the daylight, he reigns, he keeps civilization going. Chaos comes at night, sort of obliterates him for a while, and then he comes back the next day. And this sort of cosmic struggle is ongoing and at the heart of Egyptian theology. You'll also notice that Horus himself is wielding a spear. The spear seems a bit mundane, but it's actually like a cosmic weapon. If you think that Zeus has his thunderbolts, it's not just a weapon, it's sort of divinely charged. It's that sort of idea as well. And you notice he's actually slaying a hippopotamus here, which is basically like a, a demonic agent of chaos. Chaos is never directly represented. Uh, also, crocodiles are quite a common feature of that as well. You notice on the side here, wearing some like, bizarre funky hat, is um, Ptolemy, although again, because of the issues I started at the piece, we're not sure which Ptolemy it is. And he's also wielding this sort of divine spear. It's only really when you get onto the text, which thankfully, uh, because of the Rosetta Stone and things like that, we have actually translated. It's quite interesting. So first of all, Ptolemy is identified as Ptolemaeus, may he live forever, beloved of Tar. Tar is uh, a blacksmith god. You can think of Vulcan or Phaestus, those sort of parallels. And the queen, who is also depicted, the ruling Ptolemaic queen, whichever she is, is the goddess who loves her mother, the saviour. Now, the saviour is uh, Sota in Greek, and it actually refers back to Ptolemy I, who is known as Ptolemy I, Soto. And it's basically a euergetism system, where he's sort of a well-to-do man, he gets this title. And uh, the first Ptolemies were then deified as saviour gods because of that reason. And once this sort of divine cosmic struggle ends towards the end of the piece, you get this fascinating piece of text which reads, I stand in front of Horus of Bidet, I receive the crook and the whip, which are Egyptian symbols of kingship, if you think of sarcophagi, they're all like that, got one in each hand. For I am lord of this land, I take possession of the two lands, i.e. Upper and Lower Egypt, in assuming the double diadem. Now the fact that they've chosen to uh, mention this Greek iconography in an Egyptian temple is quite fascinating in itself. And it continues, I overthrow the foe of my father Osiris, Osiris is the god of the underworld, kind of like Hades, but a bit more benevolent as king of Upper and Lower Egypt forever. Now the fact that Ptolemy is saying this, and he identifies his father as Osiris, creates a direct link with Horus. And it very much fits in with the idea of the Pharaoh, which literally means great house. It never means king, most people think it does, but it's kind of the idea that um, Egypt is sort of a microcosm of the cosmos, which the, Ptolemy, uh, which the Pharaoh has control over. And this is a sort of the echoing of the divine, spear, uh, divine spheres, and so the Pharaoh rules with that authority. Now there's a problem of sort of interpreting uh, this evidence because we can look at it from a bottom-up approach, i.e. the, lo the locals doing this, or from a top-down approach is Ptolemy commanding this to be done. And seemingly there are two pieces which are contradictory. The first one is the great Mende Stela, which dates to about 270 BC under Ptolemy II, and it's for his wife slash sister, Asinui II, also ancestral relationships weren't really frowned upon in Egypt, so um, I'll read it aloud. Thereupon another ceremony was formed in honor of the queen and form granted to all the goddesses who there received a life for a second time, scattering the fumes over incense over her in each first day of the ten-day week. His majesty, I told him the second, further commanded that her ramen should be placed in all the temples. Now what's interesting is these are trilingual inscriptions and in Greek you can use impersonal passage to get rid of agency. So in Greek, doke means it is pleasing to somebody to do something. You don't have to use an agent in Greek. The fact that Ptolemy, sec uh, Ptolemy II is using the word for command in Greek is quite indicative, you know, as a forceful approach to religious iconography. But yet, seemingly, we have this over-contradictory decree, the Knopus decree, a bit later to his successor, Ptolemy II, who is getting honours for his wife, Berenike II, and their deceased daughter who died in childbirth. And it reads, and since the daughter has been born to King Ptolemaeus, the ever beloved to Tar, and the mistress of both lands, Berenike, the benevolent god, who was like cold like Berenike, and proclaimed as ruler, as it happened that this goddess had already unexpectedly turned to heaven in a virgin state suddenly, so have the priests who came from the country to the king. This is the priests coming together to decide honours for uh, Ptolemy III's wife, and also for their daughter who died in childbirth. Now, these are, as I said, on the surface, very contradictory statements because on one hand, a Ptolemaic king is commanding and on the other hand, the locals are getting together. But the uh, continuity between both degrees is that they are only for women, you will notice. The Ptolemies never command themselves to be portrayed as gods. 
And I'd like to think that that's maybe a consideration of hubris. If the Ptolemies are bringing all these Greeks to Egypt, <coughs> the Greeks don't particularly like the idea of um, people being, uh, portraying themselves as God. There was actually one Ptolemy who did this. He styled himself as Neos Dionysus, which means the new Dionysus, and apparently he just went around being morbidly obese with gout, drinking loads of wine and raping women, and he got chucked out of the capital by an angry mob, so that didn't work too well for him. <laughs> and it really comes down to this idea of uh, the, the ambiguity of t uh, Ptolemy as a brand. You know, you think about Gucci or whatever, and this is very much the Ptolemy's, how are they styling themselves in this dissimilar cultural setting. There's two pieces of cru uh, crucial evidence, I think. One is Theocritus, Idyll 17, which is basically a pastoral poem uh, praising Ptolemy II. Ptolemy II was a big advocate of the arts at Alexandria. And he states, to summarize, that Ptolemy is the richest man alive. He has a great force of arms and cities. He claims that Ptolemy II has 1,000 cities under his command, and that he's a well-to-do man. And he cares about the little man, that sort of thing. But it, <laughs> it really ends with this, um, this quote, which is fundamental. It goes, and now, Lord Ptolemy, and I will speak of thee as other demigods, Really, the poem is sort of uh, not so much, uh, it's very superficial in its praise of Ptolemy II, and it's actually dealing with a discourse of how do I praise a Greek king in Egypt? And it's sort of dealing with that dichotomy of what is acceptable between the two cultures and really exemplifying that. The other is actually a coin. <coughs> Again, it's of uh, Ptolemy III, minted about 246 to 221 BC. And the first thing you'll note, this is Ptolemy III, apparently. And he's in the guise of uh, Zeus Sarmoon, and Zeus or a moon is basically an amalgamation between Zeus and a god in, who lived in the oasis at Siwa, so far in the Libyan desert. It's what uh, Alexander styled himself as on coins. And it's actually a horn here. So it's um, sort of a, a minor allusion to divinity. It's not an outright thing, uh, certainly by no means. And you notice on the reverse it has Ptolemeo Basuleos, which in Greek which simply means of King Ptolemy, i.e. the coin is his property. This is the Ptolemaic stamp, which is an eagle superimposed on a thunderbolt. Again, you'll think of uh, Zeus's imagery yet again there. And I'm sure some of you will recognize, if you do Roman history, the famous cornucopia, which is basically the horn of plenty. It was a horn that was stuffed with like a never-ending supply of fruit and vegetables, essentially. It's meant to symbolize you know, the good health of the people and that sort of thing, the prosperity. So I think when you, you, you put all of this together as a, as a sort of cultural discourse, you can reach uh, you know, a sort of few conclusions, and that's that Ptolemy is sort of, uh, Ptolemaic dynasty is reacting against, they self-consciously are aware of the dissimilar setting they're in, they're aware that the Egyptians have their own customs. They're aware that Ptolemaic uh, baronic kingship had existed for centuries and there were certain things to do in that custom. But while they were doing that, they were also encouraging immigration to Egypt, uh, particularly Greeks who formed the Hellenistic hoplite. And so they had to be sensitive to both audiences. You know, if you're going to style yourself as some sort of divine king, kind of like Xerxes or whatever, then it isn't really going to attract the Greeks to your land. And that's pretty much it for me. <laughs> Mm. 